All right, hello again, everybody. Welcome back to Airbus 320 Tech Talk. What do all those buttons do? Thank you again so much for joining me. The topic of today's discussion is going to be the trim wheel in the A320 flight deck. So I'll go ahead and bring up the slide that we'll start to talk about today. So um, the trim wheels, uh, these guys right here, uh, I wanted to start the discussion with just a little bit of a, a recap about what specifically we're controlling on the airplane when we, when we manipulate these, these trim wheels or uh, when the airplane's manipulating them for us. And we'll, we'll get into to the details about uh, those circumstances when those two different sorts of actions are happening. But like I said, I wanted to make a, a quick recap um, because I feel like when, when we're talking about this tail surface back here, it, it, it does get a little confusing and there's, there's some terms that kind of go back and forth. And unless you... You really need to like draw them apart in your mind because it is important to understand like what exactly we're doing with the airplane and what we're controlling specifically once again with that wheel. But just to, to give you a little bit of a recap here, um, we really have two independently moving surfaces on the back end of the airplane here. So we have the, the trimmable horizontal stabilizer. That's the big section right here. And you'll also see this notated um, as THS in a lot of the manuals. So if that confuses you, that's what they're talking about, the, the trimmable horizontal stabilizer. And on the trailing edge of the surface here, we actually have the elevator. So very specifically, that wheel uh, and the trim that we're talking about is actually the, the movement of this whole surface right here. And that is in direct contrast to the actual elevator surfaces movement, which is actually when you're, when you're using the stick and you're making a forward and back movement up in the flight deck, that's very specifically what you're controlling with that. So just it's important to have that distinction in your mind about you know, when, when each surface is moving and what it's doing for us. Um, I wish I, I pulled a little bit better graphic for you too, and I'm sure you guys have noticed this in, in real world photographs of the airplane or you know, if you've ever, ever been up close walking around one of these things, but there's these marks um, on the, uh, the tail section here that'll actually tell you the, the specific location of where the trimmable horizontal stabilizer is located at at any given point in time. Now, this is obviously not necessarily of any concern to us when we're flying as we can't go back there and look at it. I, I, you know, it's, I think it's there for more of the maintenance folks you know, to, to do whatever tasks they're, they're required when they're working on these systems. Uh, but it is, it is kind of neat to see this corresponding like tick mark and, and you know, where the location of the Trimble, Trimble horizontal stabilizer is actually at as it relates to like what we can see in the flight deck and, and where that surface is, is currently residing. And just to loop in and recap another uh, fantastic question I got from a viewer. Um, I, I talked a little bit about this in the last video, but uh, he had the specific question about why you had more uh, trim movement uh, available to you in the nose up sort of scenario as opposed to the nose down scenario. And just to recap that one, it's just very basic aerodynamic and gravity sort of uh, consideration when you're talking about that. Uh, you know, just to think about what you're doing when you're flying the airplane, you're, you're needing to keep the nose pitched up, you need to defy gravity, you need, you're needing more movement um, or, or available force that you could create with this the, um, the rear surface here to keep that nose up and defy gravity and keep the airplane flying. And that's a, that is a direct contrast to, you know, if you wanted the airplane to start descending, uh, really all you need to do is zero out the, the trim or, or just stop creating, um, you know, this force in the, the uh, the opposite direction to what, what gravity's uh, you're trying to get you to do. And so, like we said, if you just zeroed out the force and did nothing else, the plane is gonna come back to, to the earth just by virtue of the fact that gravity is acting upon it. So therefore, you just plainly don't need as much um, movement available to you in the nose down direction, if that makes sense. So uh, fantastic question. I think the gentleman's name was Jim that asked that. So thanks again for, for writing with that. But uh, let's go back into the flight deck here and talk uh, a little bit more in specific about these wheels. So the, the first thing that I could tell you is that um, they are interlinked. So we obviously have one on the captain's side, one on the first officer's side, just for ease of, of access. Let's say you don't have to make this awkward uh, hand movement across the thrust levers. If you wanted to manipulate the trim wheel, that's a pretty obvious reasons uh, why they would design it like that. So just uh, just like I said, they're interconnected. They move at the same time. You can't move one in one direction and one in the other. It's uh, it's pretty simple. Um, also, you'll notice the, the white paint marks here. That's just a, a visual thing to let us know uh, when the surface is moving. Uh, in a dark flight deck, uh, it could kind of catch your eye or just draw a little bit more attention to the fact that um, they are in motion for whatever reason, just to keep you aware of that. And that is one really interesting point to, uh, to, to make here is that uh, the way these the Airbus trim wheels work is, is a very big contrast to the way they, they operate on other aircraft. 
Um, well, first of all, some aircraft don't even have a trim wheel anymore. So there's other cues to let you know what's, what's going on. But uh, it always is, uh, it's interesting to me, like when you ride in a, a 737, for example, the, the trim wheels, um, they make a lot of motion, a lot of noise. And they, they almost make this like, uh, this like, you know, very forceful, like, active spinning motion when the when the trim is in in uh, in action there and i guess like on one hand it's like there's no uh no denying or no missing the fact that the trim is moving uh it is an important you know system on the airplane so you know maybe there's some um you know there's some value to, to why they designed it that way but uh the movements on the airbus though are very subtle and and a lot of times like you won't they don't make noise it, it, unless you're looking right down straight at them like even this movement of the paint there is kind of hard to notice and you know unless you had your hand like resting on the wheel just to kind of get a feel of, like when the when the plane is kind of bumping the the uh the trim around on you you're just not really thinking about it it's not really in the forefront of your mind so just like a an interesting thing about the airbus is that these the trim wheels for the most part are kind of out of sight out of mind just left to do their own thing and that leads in very nicely to the next point that I was going to make is that um, the trim on the Airbus is it's completely automatic. So most of the time when we're flying the airplane around in normal law and doing our normal stuff, um, the plane trims on its own, right? And that's a, this is a big contrast. Like when we first learned to fly, right, you're constantly making pitch movements and you're using your hand to manually like manipulate the, um, the trim wheel. So it's just this constant like – always trying to find this happy equilibrium of just trying to keep the plane doing what you want it to do in every waking second. You know, the Airbus is, is brilliant in that, that regard, I think, where they, they've made it very easy on you. All you really do is pitch the nose to where you want it to be. You let go of the stick and the plane automatically just trims to, to whatever force is needed to just keep that, that, um, that attitude that you've asked it to do just, just locked on, you know, almost uh, more or less effortlessly. It's, it's really a nice system and it's, it's funny to, after you've gotten used to this for a while, just the thought of like going back and having to manually trim for yourself is kind of, you know, it's, it's just kind of a, um, a weird idea. Like we said, once you get used to, to doing it the Airbus way. So just a, an interesting fact about it. Um, now, there is one caveat to our normal operations, and I wanted to talk about that a little bit. And that's the only time that we're manually manipulating this trim wheel here. And that is... Uh, before we we take off, we're um, usually it's it, it, different operators might do this at a slightly different point in time, but for us it's right before we're, we're pushing back, and uh, we're going to take or set the takeoff trim setting uh, that we're going to need. So uh, to go into a little bit more detail about that, I wanted to talk about that as well. So every takeoff that we make, we're we're at a different weight, let's say, and because of the fact that we're at a different weight is going to necessitate a new or a, a unique starting point of that trimmable hor horizontal stabilizer that we're going to need to get the airplane flying in those first initial seconds of, uh, of the flight. So this is actually a very crucial thing that we have this trim set correctly when we're, we're getting ready to make a takeoff because there, there are egregious circumstances where the crew has inadvertently set the wrong trim and you could get going fast down the runway and if the trim isn't set properly, you might actually be in a, in a situation where you're, you're pulling full back on the stick given all those elevators, uh, all they've got and you still don't have enough force to raise the nose. This is a very, very extremely dangerous situation you never want to find yourself in. Uh, so uh, it's just... It highlights the point about how important this setting of the trim is for us when we get ready to take off. But just to, to cap off what I started to say, this is the, the only time during a normal flight where you're manually um, manipulating these trim wheels here. So you don't touch them after you do this initial set for any given you know normal day's flight. So uh, to come back also and uh, talk a little bit more uh, in elaboration about what it is we're looking at when we run those numbers – uh, we're getting ready to take off. So, or, or, you know, we're at the gate still, we're, we're processing this, uh, this takeoff data, let's say like generally speaking, I think most air carriers work in the same way where, you know, you have a dispatch department, they get all the final numbers about how many people are on board, you know, how many bags, uh, how much fuel, what's the final weight of the airplane that all goes off to a third party usually. And they chug all this data and then you get it back through a cars uh, your your specific calculations for your specific day, your flight, your weather conditions, all this kind of specific stuff. And it'll spit you out something that looks like this. So 
I won't go into every single detail here. This is a whole other discussion for another day, but this is what um, the takeoff numbers look for or look like for us when we're, we're getting ready to load these things in here. And, and I'm just going to pick apart the two pieces of data that specifically re relate to the, uh, the trim wheel here. So what we're looking at is um, we've got two areas on the printout here that we can reference. So right here, we have this down 0 0.3. And we also have this uh, gross takeoff weight for our takeoff. And we have a CG setting of 29.7. So this number here, 29.7, the CG setting specifically, and the, the down 0.3 are the ones that are specifically referencing uh, the, the trim wheel there and the settings that we're gonna need to use to set the plane up for takeoff. So uh, let me take a pause here, and this is uh, a great place to talk about a safety uh, consideration. Um, the way that all the manuals are written, and I think every air carrier probably does this the same way, is that anytime you're setting uh, your takeoff setting, they specifically tell you to make reference to the CG number right here, the 29.7. It's really easy to go down the track of just kind of being lazy, to be honest, and, and paying attention specifically to this number right here, the down 0.3. There's, you know, on the trim wheel itself, there's a reading, but also on the, the status page, there's a place where you can look on the flight controls and it'll just, it says very specifically a number that corresponds. It either says up or down 0 0.3. And it's kind of a, like one of those, um, it might be a little more convenient to reference this number. And I, I, you know, kind of like you could say, it's kind of like a lazy man's like way of, <laughs> of setting the trim. But this, there, this is a very, very big place where errors have occurred. Um, you know, in 99% of the time, you might do this just fine and just right. But it has happened where crews are working so fast and they mistake a down 0 0.3 for an up 0 0.3. And this goes back to what I started to say about the importance of like, if you've got that big of a difference uh, in your, uh, your trim settings for takeoff, this could really correlate to a dangerous situation down the road. So it's just an area where um, people have made this mistake and they try to like, you know, remind us like, you know, constantly, you know, every time we, we talk about this stuff, um, you know, don't, don't make reference to those numbers here. It's, it's just important to always make reference to the CG number when you're setting the trim for takeoff. Because you can't really mistake, you know, a, a 28.7 for a 29.7. I guess you, I guess you could, but at least you're going to be closer in the ballpark than you would if you were completely in an up direction versus a down direction. <laughs> so um, I hope that makes sense. That's that's probably overload on the data, like a lot of the stuff I, I give you guys here. But um, just a really unique point to to point out. And let's come back to to you know the the specific things that we're looking at on the trim wheel. Um, like I mentioned, that CG number has a scale on this side that we make reference when we're setting our, our takeoff data. And we've also got the same up and down scale uh, that, um, that correlate to what I just showed you there. But to reiterate, once again, you know, we would set this 29.7 uh, in our case for that takeoff that we were looking you know, here. We would, we would just move the trim wheel up until the arrow aligns with uh, the scale here of whatever the setting is that we wanted to, to make happen for that takeoff. So. One other interesting thing I could tell you too, you might be interested, uh, when you make movements on the trim wheel, it actually, it's just the way that it's geared, you, you actually have to make several movements of the, the wheel itself to affect like a small change uh, on the actual scale itself. And by the way, when you're, when you're moving the, um, the wheel, this whole scale will actually move in correspondence to the, the input that you're making. And it, it makes a lot of sense, like, you know, just you know, something like this on the airplane, it, it, it typically requires a bit more of, of uh, fine tuning, let's say. So if you had a very direct, like a one-to-one -one gear ratio, it might be kind of hard to get this, uh, the, um, the wheel exactly where you want it. But when you have this, this broader correlation of movements that this wheel makes to which movements are made here, you can make a fine tuned adjustment, let's say. And it's just, it's a nice way they've designed the system and something that uh, they, they put some thought into, obviously. Uh, when, uh, when we're flying around there, there normally. So uh, let's see, what else can I tell you about the trim wheel there specifically? Um, I think that pretty much wraps it up. If you guys have any questions about anything related to that, uh, feel free to leave them down in the comments section. Uh, and yeah, that's uh, actually, I, I did want to, to circle back and just talk uh, a little bit more about the times when you might have to use manual pitch trim when you're flying around. So 
To reiterate, we already recapped the normal everyday flight scenario. You only touch this thing before takeoff. You never touch it. You don't have to, to manipulate it um, when you're flying around. And even uh, to, to, uh, to cap off on that one, uh, when you get to 50 feet, uh, the airplane actually starts to, it goes into like this like flare mode sort of consideration thing. And the trim wheel will actually start returning itself to zero. And it's, it's interesting the way they've designed that, that it actually gives you um, the feel um, like every normal airplane that we've all learned to fly from day one as you slow down you're doing your flare you actually need like more and more back pressure on the stick so um, that's just kind of like a natural thing for any pilot to learn to fly anywhere so that the, the returning of the trim to zero actually aids that but then you know when you get on the ground the things zeroed out it's ready to go for the next flight so uh, an interesting note there, but um, as I started to say, that the times in in flight where you might have to use the man, the uh, the trim manually is um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think there may be some instances if you go into alternate law where you have to use manual pitch trim, and uh, definitely when you're in direct law. So these are our two you know dropped down uh, degradations, let's say, of of protections that we have on uh, on the Airbus. And by the way, I, I want to make a, another video that just talks all about the um, the uh, flight control laws, or or maybe not go into too much detail on that, but just give you guys some basic understanding about uh, these terms. But like I said, you know, alternate law, direct law. We've lost some capabilities of the airplane, um, and the the plane will actually give you a message up on the PFD. It'll say like use manual pitch trim if that's something that you're needed to do. So it kind of cues you and reminds you that it's like okay, I got to go back to um, my uh, <laughs> my initial piloting skills and uh, work this trim wheel here because uh, something has malfunctioned on the airplane. So I uh, hope that makes sense. Uh, I'll wrap it up today with a little Q and A uh, session. So. Um, this is going back a good ways. As you guys know, I took my year off there. Um, this was from a viewer, uh, gosh, about a year ago. And I, I apologize, I, I can't uh, pronounce the the characters here. It's uh, um, uh, somebody uh, with uh, with an Asian name. I'll, I'll try to leave the characters down in the com or the uh, <laughs> the description section, uh, just so you know who you are if you're still watching. Uh, I'm, I wish I could pronounce this, but. Uh, basically, uh, he had a question on the video where we were talking about the hydraulic page, and this is a, a fantastic question as well. Uh, he said, I, had a, I have a question about the blue reservoir quantity. It points to normal filling when you're on the ground, but why does it fall below normal filling when you're cruising around uh, without the rat specifically? And, and this, is a, um, this is a really good point. Um, I don't know why exactly they designed these ranges to... Uh, to appear, uh, you know, the way that they do when you look on our um, our status page for the hydraulic uh, systems, but it, it's very apparent. And this is a good point. When you are flying around, those needles that when you're on the ground show like a normal, like full reservoir, they do drop down significantly to the point where it's noticeable. Um, and the reason, the best thing I can tell you to explain that is that when the airplane is actually airborne, it's flying, you have a significant amount of fluid that's left the reservoir and it's circulating through the system and it's out servicing all the different systems on the airplane. It's doing its thing. So like normally you would have more quantity in the reservoir when the plane is at rest, but when it's doing work, when it's up, you know, flying around, like we said, just that the, the quantity of fluid is physically elsewhere in the system, like in all the tubing and all the actuators and all these different parts in the airplane that, that require the, um, the, uh, the fluid. So uh, therefore you have this, this um, place in the system where you know, in the reservoir where the reading is you know, being taken from, it just it registers that there's less quantity in there in that given instance when you're looking at it. So I uh, hope that makes sense. A fantastic question. Thanks so much for writing in. Uh, that's all I've got for you guys today. I hope you're having a wonderful day. We'll talk again real soon. Take care.